Chapter Seventeen of A Mind That Found Itself by Clifford Whittingham Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by Tom Daly. After fifteen interminable hours, the street jacket was removed. Whereas just prior to its putting on, I had been in a vigorous enough condition to offer stout resistance when wantonly assaulted. Now, on coming out of it, I was helpless. When my arms were released from their constricted position, the pain was intense. Every joint had been racked. I had no control over the fingers of either hand, and could not have dressed myself had I been promised my freedom for doing so. For more than the following week I suffered as already described though of course with gradually decreasing intensity as my racked body became accustomed to the unnatural positions it was forced to take this first experience occurred on the night of october eighteenth nineteen o two i was subjected to the same unfair unnecessary and unscientific ordeal for twenty-one consecutive nights and parts of each of the corresponding twenty-one days on more than one occasion indeed the attendant placed me in the straitjacket during the day for refusing to obey some trivial command, this too without an explicit order from the doctor in charge, though perhaps he acted under a general order. During most of this time I was held also in seclusion in a padded cell. A padded cell is a vile hole. The side walls are padded as high as a man can reach, as is also the inside of the door. One of the worst features of such cell is the lack of ventilation, which deficiency, of course, aggravates their general unsanitary condition. The cell which I was forced to occupy was practically without heat, and as winter was coming on, I suffered intensely from the cold. Frequently it was so cold I could see my breath, though my canvas jacket served to protect part of that body which it was at the same time racking. I was seldom comfortably warm, for once uncovered, my arms being pinioned, I had no way of rearranging the blankets. What little sleep I managed to get, I took lying on a hard mattress placed on a bare floor. The condition of the mattress I found in the cell was such that I objected to its further use, and the fact that another was supplied at a time when few of my requests were being granted proves its disgusting condition. For this period of three weeks, from October 18th until November 8th, 1902, when I left this institution and was transferred to a state hospital, I was continuously under lock and key in the padded cell or some other room, or under the eye of an attendant. Over half the time I was in the snug but cruel embrace of a straitjacket, about three hundred hours in all. While being subjected to this terrific abuse, I was held in exile. I was cut off from all direct and all honest indirect communication with my legally appointed conservator, my own brother, and also with all other relatives and friends. I was even cut off from satisfactory communication with the superintendent. I saw him but twice, and then for so short a time that I was unable to give him any convincing idea of my plight. These interviews occurred on two Sundays that fell within my period of exile, for it was on Sunday that the superintendent usually made his weekly round of inspection. What chance had I of successfully pleading my case while my pulpit was a padded cell and the congregation, with the exception of the superintendent, the very ones who had been abusing me? At such times my pent-up indignation poured itself forth in such a disconnected way that my protests were robbed of their right ring of truth. I was not incoherent in speech. I was simply voluble and digressive, a natural incident of elation. Such notes as I managed to write on scraps of paper were presumably confiscated by Jekyll Hyde. At all events, it was not until some months later that the superintendent was informed of my treatment when, at my request, though I was then elsewhere, the governor of the state discussed the subject with him. How I brought about that discussion, while still virtually a prisoner in another place, 
will be narrated in due time and not until several days after i had left this institution and had been placed in another when for the first time in six weeks i saw my conservator did he learn of the treatment to which i had been subjected from his office in new haven he had telephoned several times to the assistant physician and inquired about my condition though jekyll hyde did tell him that i was highly excited and difficult to control he did not even hint that i was being subjected to any unusual restraint dr jekyll deceived everyone and as things turned out deceived himself for had he realized that i should one day be able to do what i have since done his brutality would surely have been held in check by his discretion how helpless how at the mercy of his keepers a patient may be is further illustrated by the conduct of this same man once during the third week of my nights in a straitjacket i refused to take certain medicine which an attendant offered me for some time i had been regularly taking this innocuous concoction without protest but i now decided that as the attendant refused most of my requests i should no longer comply with all of his he did not argue the point with me he simply reported my refusal to dr jekyll a few minutes later dr jekyll or rather mr hyde accompanied by three attendants entered the padded cell i was robed for the night in a straitjacket mr hyde held in his hand a rubber tube an attendant stood near with the medicine for over two years the common threat had been made that the tube would be resorted to if i refused medicine or food i had begun to look upon it as a myth but its presence in the hands of an oppressor now convinced me of its reality i saw that the doctor and his bravos meant business and as i had already endured torture enough i determined to make every concession this time and escape what seemed to be in store for me what are you going to do with that i asked eyeing the tube the attendant says you refuse to take your medicine we are going to make you take it i'll take your old medicine was my reply you have had your chance all right i said put that medicine into me any way you think best but the time will come when you'll wish you hadn't when that time does come it won't be easy to prove that you had the right to force a patient to take medicine he had offered to take i know something about the ethics of your profession you have no right to do anything to a patient except what's good for him you know that all you are trying to do is to punish me and i give you fair warning i'm going to camp on your trail till you are not only discharged from this institution but expelled from the state medical society as well you are a disgrace to your profession and that society will attend to your case fast enough when certain members of it who are friends of mine hear about this furthermore i shall report your conduct to the governor of the state he can take some action even if this is not a state institution now damn you do your worst coming from one in my condition this was rather straight talk the doctor was visibly disconcerted had he not feared to lose caste with the attendants who stood by i think he would have given me another chance but he had too much pride and too little manhood to recede from a false position already taken i no longer resisted even verbally for i no longer wanted the doctor to desist though i did not anticipate the operation with pleasure i was eager to take the man's measure he and the attendants knew that i usually kept a trick or two even up the sleeve of a straitjacket so they took added precautions i was flat on my back with simply a mattress between me and the floor one attendant held me another stood by with the medicine and with a funnel through which as soon as mr hyde should insert the tube into one of my nostrils the dose would be poured the third attendant stood near as a reserve force though the insertion of the tube when skilfully done need not cause suffering the operation as conducted by mr hyde was painful try as he would he was unable to insert the tube properly though in no way did i attempt to balk him his embarrassment seemed to rob his hand of whatever cunning it may have possessed 
After what seemed ten minutes of bungling, though it was probably not half that, he gave up the attempt, but not until my nose had begun to bleed. He was plainly chagrined when he and his bravos retired. Intuitively, I felt that they would soon return. That they did, armed with a new implement of war. This time the doctor inserted between my teeth a large wooden peg to keep open a mouth which he usually wanted shut. He then forced down my throat a rubber tube. The attendant adjusted the funnel, and the medicine, or rather liquid, for its medicinal properties were without effect upon me, was poured in. As the scant report sent to my conservator during these three weeks indicated that I was not improving as he had hoped, he made a special trip to the institution to investigate in person. On his arrival he was met by none other than Dr. Jekyll, who told him that I was in a highly excited condition, which, he intimated, would be aggravated by a personal interview. Now for a man to see his brother in such a plight as mine would be a distressing ordeal, and though my conservator came within a few hundred feet of my prison cell, it naturally took but a suggestion to dissuade him from coming nearer. Dr. Jekyll did tell him that it had been found necessary to place me in restraint and seclusion, the professional euphemisms for straitjacket, padded cell, etc. But no hint was given that I had been roughly handled. Dr. Jekyll's politic dissuasion was no doubt inspired by the knowledge that if I ever got within speaking distance of my conservator, nothing could prevent my giving him a circumstantial account of my sufferings, which account would have been corroborated by the blackened eye I happened to have at the time. Indeed, in dealing with my conservator, the assistant physician showed a degree of tact which, had it been directed toward myself, would have sufficed to keep me tolerably comfortable. My conservator, though temporarily stayed, was not convinced. He felt that I was not improving where I was, and he wisely decided that the best course would be to have me transferred to a public institution, the state hospital. A few days later, the judge who had originally committed me ordered my transfer. Nothing was said to me about the proposed change until the moment of departure, and then I could scarcely believe my ears. In fact, I did not believe my informant, for three weeks of abuse, together with my continued inability to get in touch with my conservator, had so shaken my reason that there was a partial recurrence of old delusions. I imagined myself on the way to the state prison, a few miles distant, and not until the train had passed the prison station did I believe that I was really on my way to the state hospital. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of A Mind That Found Itself by Clifford Whittingham Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by Tom Daly. Chapter 18 The state hospital in which I now found myself, the third institution to which I had been committed, though in many respects above average of such institutions, was typical. It commanded a wide view of a beautiful river and valley. This view I was permitted to enjoy, at first. Those in charge of the institution which I had just left did not give my new custodians any detailed account of my case. Their reticence was, I believed, occasioned by chagrin rather than charity. Tamers of wild men have as much pride as tamers of wild animals, but unfortunately less skill and to admit defeat is a thing not to be thought of. Though private institutions are prone to shift their troublesome cases to state institutions, there is too often a deplorable lack of sympathy and cooperation between them, which in this instance, however, proved fortunate for me. From October 18th until the early afternoon of November 8th, at the private institution, I had been classed as a raving maniac. The name, 
I had brought upon myself by experimental conduct. The condition had been aggravated and perpetuated by the stupidity of those in authority over me, and it was the same experimental conduct on my part and stupidity on the part of my new custodians which gave rise, two weeks later, to a similar situation. On Friday, November 7th, I was in a straitjacket. On November 9th and 10th, I was apparently as tractable as any of the 2,300 patients in the state hospital, conventionally clothed, mild-mannered, and seemingly right-minded. On the 9th, the day after my arrival, I attended a church service held at the hospital. My behavior was not other than that of most pious worshippers in the land. The next evening, with most exemplary deportment, I attended one of the dances which are held every fortnight during the winter. Had I been a raving maniac, such activities would have led to a disturbance, for maniacs of necessity disregard the conventions of both pious and polite society. Yet on either of these days, had I been in the private institution which I had recently left, I should have occupied a cell and worn a straight jacket. The assistant superintendent, who received me upon my arrival, judged me by my behavior. He assigned me to one of two connecting wards, the best in the hospital, where about seventy patients led a fairly agreeable life. Though no official account of my case had accompanied my transfer, the attendant who had acted as escort and guard had already given an attendant at the state hospital a brief account of my recent experiences. Yet, when this report finally reached the ears of those in authority, they wisely decided not to transfer me to another ward, so long as I caused no trouble where I was. Finding myself at last among friends, I lost no time in asking for writing and drawing materials, which had so rudely been taken from me three weeks earlier. My request was promptly granted. The doctors and attendants treated me kindly, and I again began to enjoy life. My desire to write and draw had not abated. However, I did not devote my entire time to those pursuits, for there were plenty of congenial companions about. I found pleasure in talking, more pleasure by far than others did in listening. In fact, I talked incessantly, and soon made known, in a general way, my scheme for reforming institutions not only in my native state, but, of course, throughout the world, for my grandiose perspective made the earth look small. The attendants had to bear the brunt of my loquacity, and they soon grew weary. One of them, wishing to induce silence, ventured to remark that I was so crazy I could not possibly keep my mouth shut for even one minute. It was a challenge which aroused my fighting spirit. I'll show you that I can stop talking for a whole day, I said. He laughed, knowing that of all difficult tasks, this which I had imposed upon myself was, for one in my condition, least likely of accomplishment. But I was good as my boast. Until the same hour the next day, I refused to speak to anyone. I did not even reply to civil questions, and though my silence was deliberate and good-natured, the assistant physician seemed to consider it of a contumacious variety, for he threatened to transfer me to a less desirable ward unless I should again begin to talk. That day of self-imposed silence was about the longest I have ever lived, for I was under a word pressure sufficient to have filled a book. Any psychiatrist will admit that my performance was remarkable, and he will further agree that it was, at least, an indication of a high degree of self-control. Though I have no desire to prove that at this period I was not in an abnormal condition, I do wish to show that I had a degree of self-control that probably would have enabled me to remain in the best ward at this institution had I not been intent, abnormally intent, of course, and yet with a high degree of deliberation, upon a reformative investigation. The crest of my wave of elation had been reached early in October. It was now, November, that the curve representing my return to normality should have been continuous and diminishing. 
Instead, it was kept violently fluctuating, or at least its fluctuations were aggravated, by the impositions of those in charge of me, induced sometimes, I freely admit, by deliberate and purposeful transgressions of my own. My condition during my three weeks of exile just ended had been, if anything, one of milder excitement than that which had obtained previously during the first seven weeks of my period of elation, and my condition during the two weeks I now remained in the best ward in the state hospital was not different from my condition during the preceding three weeks of torture, or the succeeding three weeks of abuse and privation, except in so far as a difference was occasioned by the torture and privation themselves. Though I had long intended to effect reforms in the existing methods of treatment, my reckless desire to investigate violent wards did not possess me until I myself had experienced the torture of continued confinement in one such ward before coming to this state institution. It was simple to deduce that if one could suffer such abuses as I had while a patient in a private institution, nay, in two private institutions, brutality must exist in a state hospital also. Thus it was that I entered the state hospital with a firm resolve to inspect personally every type of ward, good and bad. But I was in no hurry to begin. My recent experience had exhausted me, and I wished to regain strength before subjecting myself to another such ordeal. This desire to recuperate controlled my conduct for a while, but its influence gradually diminished as life became more and more monotonous. I soon found the good ward entirely too polite. I craved excitement, action, and I determined to get it, regardless of consequences, though I am free to confess I should not have had the courage to proceed with my plan had I known what was in store for me. About this time my conservator called to see me. Of course I told him all about my cruel experiences at the private institution. My account surprised and distressed him. I also told him that I knew for a fact that similar conditions existed at the state hospital, as I had heard convincing rumors to that effect. He urged me to behave myself and remain in the ward where I was, which ward, as I admitted, was all that one could desire, provided one had schooled himself to desire that sort of thing. The fact that I was under lock and key and behind what was virtually prison bars in no way gave me a sense of helplessness. I firmly believed that I should find it easy to effect my escape and reach home for the Thanksgiving Day celebration. And furthermore, I knew that, should I reach home, I should not be denied my portion of the good things to eat before being returned to the hospital. Being under the spell of an intense desire to investigate the violent ward, I concluded that the time for action had come. I reasoned, too, that it would be easier and safer to escape from that ward, which was on a level with the ground, than from a ward three stories above it. The next thing I did was to inform the attendants, not to mention several of the patients, that within a day or two I should do something to cause my removal to it. They, of course, did not believe that I had any idea of deliberately inviting such a transfer. My very frankness disarmed them. On the evening of November 21st, I went from room to room collecting all sorts of odds and ends belonging to other patients. These I secreted in my room. I also collected a small library of books, magazines, and newspapers. After securing all the booty I dared, I mingled with the other patients until the time came for going to bed. The attendants soon locked me up in my junk shop, and I spent the rest of the night setting it in disorder. My original plan had been to barricade the door during the night, and thus hold the doctors and attendants at bay until those in authority had accepted my ultimatum, which was to include a Thanksgiving visit at home. But before morning I had slightly altered my plan. 
My sleepless night of activity had made me ravenously hungry, and I decided that it would be wiser not only to fill my stomach, but to lay by other supplies of food before submitting to a siege. Accordingly, I set things to rights and went about my business the next morning as usual. At breakfast, I ate enough for two men, and put in my pockets bread enough to last for twenty-four hours at least. Then I returned to my room and at once barricaded the door. My barricade consisted of a wardrobe, several drawers which I had removed from the bureau, and a number of books, among them Paradise Lost and the Bible. These, with conscious satisfaction, I placed in a position as a keystone. Thus the floor space between the door and the opposite wall of the room was completely filled. My roommate, a young fellow in the speechless condition in which I had been during my period of depression, was in the room with me. This was accidental. It was no part of my plan to hold him as a hostage, though I might finally have used him as a pawn in the negotiations had my barricade resisted the impending attack longer than it did. It was not long before the attendants realized that something was wrong. They came to my door and asked me to open it. I refused, and told them that to argue the point would be a waste of time. They tried to force an entrance. Failing in that, they reported to the assistant physician, who soon appeared. At first he parlayed with me. I good-naturedly, but emphatically, told him that I could not be talked out of the position I had taken, nor could I be taken out of it until I was ready to surrender, for my barricade was one that would surely hold. I also announced that I had carefully planned my line of action and knew what I was about. I complimented him on his hitherto tactful treatment of me, and grandiloquently, yet sincerely, thanked him for his many courtesies. I also expressed entire satisfaction with the past conduct of the attendants. In fact, on part of the institution, I put the stamp of my approval. But, I said, I know there are wards in this hospital where helpless patients are brutally treated, and I intend to put a stop to these abuses at once, not until the governor of the state, the judge who committed me, and my conservator come to this door will I open it. When they arrive, we'll see whether or not patients are to be robbed of their rights and abused. My speech was made through a screen transom over the door. For a few minutes, the doctor continued his persuasive methods, but that he should even imagine that I would basely recede from my high and mighty position only irritated me the more. "'You can stand outside that door all day if you choose,' I said. "'I won't open it until the three men I have named appear. "'I have prepared for a siege, "'and I have enough food in this room to keep me going for a day anyway.' "'Realizing at last that no argument would move me, "'he set about forcing an entrance. First, he tried to remove the transom "'by striking it with a stout stick.' I gave blow for blow, and the transom remained in place. A carpenter was then sent for, but before he could go about his work, one of the attendants managed to open the door enough to thrust in his arm and shove aside my barricade. I did not realize what was being done, until it was too late to interfere. The door once opened, in rushed the doctor and four attendants. Without ceremony, I was thrown upon the bed with two or three of the attacking force on top of me. Again I was choked, this time by the doctor. The operation was a matter of only a moment, but before it was over I had the good fortune to deal the doctor a stinging blow on the jaw, for which, as he was about my own age and the odds were five to one, I had never felt called upon to apologize. Once I was subdued, each of the four attendants attached himself to a leg or an arm, and, under the direction and leadership of the doctor, I was carried bodily through two corridors, down two flights of stairs, and to the violent ward. 
my dramatic exit startled my fellow patients for so much action in so short a time is seldom seen in a quiet ward and few patients placed in the violent ward are introduced with so impressive an array of camp followers as I had that day. All this to me was a huge joke, with a good purpose behind it. Though excited, I was good-natured, and on the way to my new quarters, I said to the doctor, Whether you believe it or not, it's a fact that I'm going to reform these institutions before I'm done. I raised this rumpus to make you transfer me to the violent ward. What I want you to do now is to show me the worst you've got. You needn't worry, the doctor said. You'll get it. He spoke the truth. End of chapter 18、chapter、19 Chapter Nineteen of A Mind That Found Itself by Clifford Whittingham Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by Tom Daly. Chapter Nineteen. Even for a violent ward, my entrance was spectacular, if not dramatic. The three attendants regularly in charge naturally jumped to the conclusion that in me a troublesome patient had been foisted upon them. They noted my arrival with an unpleasant curiosity, which in turn aroused my curiosity. For it took but a glance to convince me that my burly keepers were typical attendants of the brute force type. Acting on the order of the doctor in charge, one of them stripped me of my outer garments, and clad in nothing but underclothes, I was thrust into a cell. Few, if any, prisons in this country contain worse holes than this cell proved to be. It was one of five, situated in a short corridor. Adjoining the main ward. It was about six feet wide by ten long and of a good height. A heavily screened and barred window admitted light and a negligible quantity of air, for the ventilation scarcely deserved the name. The walls and floor were bare, and there was no furniture. A patient confined here must lie on the floor with no substitute for a bed but one or two felt druggets. Sleeping under such conditions becomes tolerable after a time, but not until one has become accustomed to lying on a surface nearly as hard as a stone. Here, as well indeed as in other parts of the ward, for a period of three weeks I was again forced to breathe and re breathe air so vitiated that even when I occupied a larger room in the same ward, doctors and attendants seldom entered without remarking its quality. My first meal increased my distaste for my semi sociological experiment. For over a month, I was kept in a half starved condition. At each meal, to be sure, I was given as much food as was served to other patients, but an average portion was not adequate to the needs of a patient as active as I was at this time. Worst of all, winter was approaching, and these, my first quarters, were without heat. As my olfactory nerves soon became uncommunicative, the breathing of foul air was not a hardship. On the other hand, to be famished the greater part of the time was a very conscious hardship. But to be half frozen day in and day out for a long period was exquisite torture. Of all the suffering I endured, that occasioned by confinement in cold cells seemed to have made the most lasting impression. Hunger is a local disturbance, but when one is cold, every nerve in the body registers its call for help. Long before reading a certain passage of De Quincey's, I had decided that cold could cause greater suffering than hunger. Consequently, it was with great satisfaction that I read the following sentences from his Confessions O、oh, ancient women, daughter of toil and suffering, Among all the hardships and bitter inheritance of flesh that ye are called upon to face, not one, not even hunger, seems in my eyes comparable to that of nightly cold. A more killing curse there does not exist for man or woman than the bitter combat between the weariness that prompts sleep and the keen searching cold 
that forces you from the first access of sleep to start up horror-stricken and to seek warmth vainly in renewed exercise though long since fainting under fatigue the hardness of the bed and the coldness of the room were not all that interfered with sleep the short corridor in which i was placed was known as the bullpen a phrase eschewed by the doctors it was usually in an uproar especially during the dark hours of the early morning patients in a state of excitement may sleep during the first hours of the night but seldom all night and even should one have the capacity to do so his companion's endurance would wake him with a shout or a song or a curse or the kicking of a door a noisy and chaotic medley frequently continued without interruption for hours at a time noise unearthly noise was the poetic license allowed the occupants of these cells i spent several days and nights in one or another of them and i question whether i averaged more than two or three hours sleep a night during that time seldom did the regular attendants pay any attention to the noise though even they must at times have been disturbed by it in fact the only person likely to attempt to stop it was the night watch who when he did enter a cell for that purpose almost invariably kicked or choked the noisy patient into a state of temporary quiet i noted this and scented trouble drawing and writing materials having been again taken from me i cast about for some new occupation i found one in the problem of warmth though i gave repeated expression to the benumbed messages of my tortured nerves the doctors refused to return my clothes for a semblance of warmth i was forced to depend upon ordinary undergarments and an extraordinary imagination the heavy felt druggets were about as plastic as blotting paper and i derived little comfort from them until i hit upon the idea of rending them into strips these strips i would weave into a crude rip van winkle kind of suit and so intricate was the warp and woof that on several occasions an attendant had to cut me out of these sartorial improvisations at first until i acquired the destructive knack the tearing of one drugget into strips was a task of four or five hours but in time i became so proficient that i could completely destroy more than one of these six by eight foot druggets in a single night during the following weeks of my close confinement i destroyed at least twenty of them each worth as i found out later about four dollars and i confess i found a peculiar satisfaction in the destruction of property belonging to a state which had deprived me of all my effects except underclothes but my destructiveness was due to a variety of causes it was occasioned primarily by a pressure of activity for which the tearing of druggets served as a vent i was in a state of mind aptly described in a letter written during my first month of elation in which i said i'm as busy as a nest of ants though the habit of tearing druggets was an outgrowth of an abnormal impulse the habit itself lasted longer than it could have done had i not for so long a time been deprived of suitable clothes and been held a prisoner in cold cells but another motive soon asserted itself being deprived of all the luxuries of life and most of the necessities my mother wit always conspiring with a wild imagination for something to occupy my tune led me at last to invade the field of invention with appropriate contrariety an unfamiliar and hitherto almost detested line of investigation now attracted me abstruse mathematical problems which had defied solution for centuries began to appear easy to defy the state and its puny representatives had become mere child's play so i forthwith decided to overcome no less a force than gravity itself my conquering imagination soon tricked me into believing that i could lift myself by my bootstraps or rather that i could do so when my laboratory should contain footgear that lent itself to the experiment but what of the strips of felt torn from the druggets 
why these i used as the straps of my missing boots and having no boots to stand in i used my bed as boots i reasoned that for my scientific purpose a man in bed was as favorably suited as a man in boots therefore attaching a sufficient number of my felt strips to the head and foot of the bed which happened not to be screwed to the floor and in turn attaching the free ends to the transom and the window guard i found the problem very simple for i next joined these cloth cables in such a manner that by pulling downward i effected a readjustment of stress and strain and my bed with me in it was soon dangling in space my sensations at this momentous instant must have been much like those which thrilled newton when he solved one of the riddles of the universe indeed they must have been more intense for newton knowing had his doubts i not knowing had no doubts at all so epoch-making did this discovery appear to me that i noted the exact position of the bed so that a wondering posterity might ever afterward view and revere the exact spot on the earth's surface whence one of man's greatest thoughts had winged its way to immortality for weeks i believed i had uncovered a mechanical principle which would enable man to defy gravity and i talked freely and confidently about it that is i proclaimed the impending results the intermediate steps in the solution of my problem i ignored for good reasons a blind man may harness a horse so long as the horse is harnessed one need not know the office of each strap and buckle gravity was harnessed that was all meanwhile i felt sure that another sublime moment of inspiration would intervene and clear the atmosphere thus rendering flight of the body as easy as a flight of imagination end of chapter 19chapter twenty of a mind that found itself by clifford whittingham beers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain read by tom daly chapter twenty while my inventive operations were in progress i was chafing under the unjust and certainly unscientific treatment to which i was being subjected in spite of my close confinement in vile cells for a period of over three weeks i was denied a bath i do not regret this deprivation for the attendants who at the beginning were unfriendly might have forced me to bathe in water which had first served for several other patients though such an unsanitary and disgusting practice was contrary to rules it was often indulged in by the lazy brutes who controlled the ward I continued to object to the inadequate portions of food served me. On Thanksgiving Day, for I had not succeeded in escaping and joining in the celebration at home, an attendant, in the unaccustomed role of a ministering angel, brought me the usual turkey and cranberry dinner, which, on two days a year, is provided by an intermittently generous state. Turkey, being the rara avis for the imprisoned, it was but natural that I should desire to gratify a palate long insulted. I wished not only to satisfy my appetite, but to impress indelibly a memory which for months had not responded to so agreeable a stimulus. While lingering over the delights of this experience, I forgot all about the ministering angel, but not for long. He soon returned. Observing that I had scarcely touched my feast, he said, if you don't eat that dinner in a hurry i'll take it from you i don't see what difference it makes to you whether i eat it in a hurry or take my time about it i said it's the best i've had in many a day and i have a right to get as much pleasure out of it as i can we'll see about that he replied and snatching it away he stalked out of the room leaving me to satisfy my hunger on the memory of vanished luxuries thus did a feast become a fast under this treatment i soon learned to be more noisy than my neighbors i was never without a certain humor in contemplating not only my surroundings but myself 
and the demonstrations in which I began to indulge were partly in fun and partly by way of protest. In these outbursts I was assisted, and at times inspired, by a young man in the room next mine. He was about my own age, and was enjoying the same phase of exuberance as myself. We talked and sang at all hours of the night. At the time, we believed that the other patients enjoyed the spice which we added to the restricted variety of their lives, but later I learned that a majority of them looked upon us as the worst of nuisances. We gave the doctors and attendants no rest, at least not intentionally. Whenever the assistant physician appeared, we upbraided him for the neglect which was then our portion. At one time or another, we were banished to the bullpen for these indiscretions, and had there been a viler place of confinement still, our performances in the bullpen undoubtedly would have brought us to it. At last the doctor hit upon the expedient of transferring me to a room more remote from my inspiring, and I may say conspiring, companion. Talking to each other ceased to be the easy pastime it had been, so we gradually lapsed into a comparative silence which must have proved a boon to our wardmates. The megaphonic bullpen, however, continued with irregularity but annoying certainty to furnish its quota of noise. On several occasions I concocted plans to escape, and not only that, but also to liberate others. That I did not make the attempt was the fault, or merit perhaps, of a certain night watch whose timidity, rather than sagacity, impelled him to refuse to unlock my door early one morning, although I gave him a plausible reason for the request. This night watch, I learned later, admitted that he feared to encounter me single-handed, and on this particular occasion well might he, for during the night I had woven a spider-web net in which I intended to enmesh him. Had I succeeded, there would have been a lively hour for him in the violent ward. Had I failed, there would have been a lively hour for me. There were several comparatively sane patients, especially my elated neighbor, whose willing assistance I could have secured. Then the regular attendants could have been held prisoner in their own room, if indeed we had not in turn overpowered them and transferred them to the bullpen, where the several victims of their abuse might have given them a deserved dose of their own medicine. This scheme of mine was a prank rather than a plot. I had an inordinate desire to prove that one could escape if he had a mind to do so. Later I boasted to the assistant physician of my unsuccessful attempt. This boast he evidently tucked away in his memory. My punishment for harmless antics of this sort was prompt in coming. The attendants seemed to think their whole duty to their closely confined charges consisted in delivering three meals a day. Between meals he was a rash patient who interfered with their leisure. Now one of my greatest crosses was their continued refusal to give me a drink when I asked for it, except at mealtime or on those rare occasions when I was permitted to go to the washroom. I had to get along as best I might with no water to drink, and that too at a time when I was in a fever of excitement. My polite requests were ignored, impolite demands were answered with threats and curses, and this war of requests, demands, threats, and curses continued until the night of the fourth day of my banishment. Then the attendants made good their threats of assault. That they had been trying to goad me into a fighting mood I well knew and often accused them of their mean purpose. They brazenly admitted that they were simply waiting for a chance to slug me, and promised to punish me well as soon as I should give them a slight excuse for doing so. On the night of November twenty-fifth, 1902, the head attendant and one of his assistants passed my door. They were returning from one of the dances, which, at intervals during the winter, the management provided for the nurses and attendants. While they were within hearing, I asked for a drink of water. It was a carefully worded request, but they were in a hurry to get to bed, and refused me with curses. Then I replied in kind, 
"'If I come there, I'll kill you,' one of them said. "'Well, you won't get in if I can help it,' I replied, as I braced my iron bedstead against the door. My defiance and defenses gave the attendants the excuse for which they had said they were waiting, and my success in keeping them out for two or three minutes only served to enrage them. By the time they had gained entrance, they had become furies. One was a young man of twenty-seven. Physically, he was a fine specimen of manhood. Morally, he was deficient, thanks to the dehumanizing effect of several years in the employ of different institutions whose officials countenanced improper methods of care and treatment. It was he who now attacked me in the dark of my prison room. The head attendant stood by, holding a lantern which shed a dim light. The door once open, I offered no further resistance. First, I was knocked down. Then for several minutes I was kicked about the room, struck, kneed, and choked. My assailant even attempted to grind his heel into my cheek. In this he failed, for I was there protected by a heavy beard which I wore at the time. But my shins, elbows, and back were cut by his heavy shoes, and had I not instinctively drawn up my knees to my elbows for the protection of my body, I might have been seriously, perhaps fatally, injured. As it was, I was severely cut and bruised. When my strength was nearly gone, I feigned unconsciousness. This ruse alone saved me from further punishment, for usually a premeditated assault is not ended until the patient is mute and helpless. When they had accomplished their purpose, they left me huddled in a corner to wear out the night as best I might, to live or die for all they cared. Strange as it may seem, I slept well, but not at once. Within five minutes I was busily engaged writing an account of the assault. A trained war correspondent could not have pulled himself together in less time. As usual, I had recourse to my bit of contraband lead pencil, this time a pencil which had been smuggled to me the very first day of my confinement in the bullpen by a sympathetic fellow patient. When he had pushed under my cell door that little implement of war, it had loomed as large in my mind as a battering ram. Paper I had none, but I had previously found walls to be a fair substitute. I therefore now selected and wrote upon a rectangular spot, about three feet by two, which marked the reflection of a light in the corridor just outside my transom. The next morning, when the assistant physician appeared, he was accompanied as usual by the guilty head attendant, who, on the previous night, had held the lantern. Doctor, I said, I have something to tell you, and I glanced significantly at the attendant. Last night I had a most unusual experience. I have had many imaginary experiences during the past two years and a half, and it may be that last night's was not real. Perhaps the whole thing was phantasmagoric, like what I used to see during the first months of my illness. Whether it was so or not, I shall leave you to judge. It just happens to be my impression that I was brutally assaulted last night, if it was a dream, it is the first thing of the kind that ever left visible evidence on my body. With that, I uncovered to the doctor a score of bruises and lacerations. I knew these would be more impressive than any words of mine. The doctor put on a knowing look, but said nothing, and soon left the room. His guilty subordinate tried to appear unconcerned and I really believe he thought me not absolutely sure of the events of the previous night, or at least unaware of his share in them. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 Of A Mind That Found Itself By Clifford Whittingham Beers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by Tom Daly. Chapter 21 Neither of the attendants involved in the assault upon me was discharged. This fact made me more eager to gain wider knowledge of conditions. 
the self-control which had enabled me to suspend speech for a whole day, now stood me in good stead. It enabled me to avert much suffering that would have been my portion had I been like the majority of my wardmates. Time and again I surrendered when an attendant was about to chastise me. But at least a score of patients in the ward were not so well equipped mentally, and these were viciously assaulted again and again by the very men who had so thoroughly initiated me into the mysteries of their black art. I soon observed that the only patients who were not likely to be subjected to abuse were the very ones least in need of care and treatment. The violent, noisy, and troublesome patient was abused because he was violent, noisy, and troublesome. The patient too weak, physically or mentally, to attend to his own wants, was frequently abused because of that very helplessness which made it necessary for the attendants to wait upon him. Usually a restless or troublesome patient, placed in the violent ward, was assaulted the very first day. This procedure seemed to be a part of the established code of dishonor. The attendants imagined that the best way to gain control of a patient was to cow him from the first. In fact, these fellows, nearly all of them ignorant and untrained, seemed to believe that violent cases could not be handled in any other way. One attendant, on the very day he had been discharged, for choking a patient into an insensibility so profound that it had been necessary to call a physician to restore him, said to me, they are getting pretty damned strict these days, discharging a man simply for choking a patient. This illustrates the attitude of many attendants. On the other hand, that the discharged employees soon secured a position in a similar institution not twenty miles distant illustrates the attitude of some hospital managements. I recall the advent of a new attendant, a young man studying to become a physician. At first he seemed inclined to treat patients kindly, but he soon fell into brutal ways. His change of heart was due partly to the brutalizing environment, but more directly to the attitude of the three hardened attendants who mistook his consideration for cowardice and taunted him for it. Just to prove his mettle he began to assault patients and one day knocked me down simply for refusing to stop my prattle at his command. That the environment in some institutions is brutalizing was strikingly shown in the testimony of an attendant at a public investigation in Kentucky, who said, When I came here, if anyone had told me I would be guilty of striking patients, I would have called him crazy himself but now i take delight in punching hell out of them i found also that an unnecessary and continued lack of outdoor exercise tended to multiply deeds of violence patients were supposed to be taken for a walk at least once a day and twice when the weather permitted yet those in the violent ward and it is they who most need the exercise usually got out of doors only when the attendants saw fit to take them. For weeks a wardmate, a man sane enough to enjoy freedom had he a home to go to, kept a record of the number of our walks. It showed that we averaged not more than one or two a week for a period of two months, this too in the face of many pleasant days, which made the close confinement doubly irksome. The lazy fellows on whose leisure we waited preferred to remain in the ward, playing cards, smoking, and telling their kind of stories. The attendants needed regular exercise quite as much as the patients, and when they failed to employ their energy in this healthful way, they were likely to use it at the expense of the bodily comfort of their helpless charges. If lack of exercise produced a need of discipline, each disciplinary move, on the other hand, served only to inflame us the more. Some wild animals can be clubbed into a semblance of obedience, yet it is a treacherous obedience at best, and justly so. And that is the only kind of obedience into which a man can be clubbed. 
To imagine otherwise of a human being, sane or insane, is the very essence of insanity itself. A temporary leisure may be won for the aggressor, but in the long run he will be put to greater inconvenience than he would be by a more humane method. It was repression and willful frustration of reasonable desires which kept me a seeming maniac and made seeming maniacs of others. Whenever I was released from lock and key and permitted to mingle with the so-called violent patients, I was surprised to find that comparatively few were by nature troublesome or noisy. A patient, calm in mind and passive in behavior three hundred and sixty days in the year, may, on one of the remaining days, commit some slight transgression, or, more likely, be goaded into one by an attendant, or needlessly led into one by a tactless physician. His indiscretion may consist merely in an unmannerly announcement to the doctor of how lightly the latter is regarded by the patient. At once he is banished to the violent ward, there to remain for weeks, perhaps indefinitely. End of chapter 21「XXII. Of a Mind that Found Itself » by Clifford Whittingham Beers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by Tom Daly. CHAPTER XXII Like fires and railroad disasters, assaults seemed to come in groups. Days would pass without a single outbreak. Then would come a veritable carnival of abuse due almost invariably to the attendant's state of mind, not to an unwanted aggressiveness on the part of the patients. I can recall as especially noteworthy several instances of atrocious abuse. Five patients were chronic victims. Three of them, peculiarly irresponsible, suffered with especial regularity, scarcely a day passing without bringing to them its quota of punishment. One of these, almost an idiot, and quite too inarticulate to tell a convincing story even under the most favorable conditions, became so cowed that, whenever an attendant passed, he would circle his oppressor as a whipped cur circles a cruel master. If this avoidance became too marked, the attendant would then and there chastise him for the implied but unconscious insult. There was a young man, occupying a cell next to mine in the bullpen, who was so far out of his mind as to be absolutely irresponsible. His offense was that he could not comprehend and obey. Day after day I could hear the blows and kicks as they fell upon his body, and his incoherent cries for mercy were as painful to hear as they are impossible to forget. That he survived is surprising. What wonder that this man, who was so violent, or who was made violent, would not permit the attendants to dress him. But he had a half-witted friend, a wardmate, who could coax him into his clothes, when his oppressors found him most intractable. Of all the patients known to me, the one who was assaulted with the greatest frequency was an incoherent and irresponsible man of sixty years. This patient was restless and forever talking or shouting, as any man might have oppressed by such delusions as his. He was profoundly convinced that one of the patients had stolen his stomach, an idea inspired perhaps by the remarkable corpulency of the person he accused. His loss he would woefully voice even while eating. Of course, argument to the contrary had no effect, and his monotonous recital of his imaginary troubles made him unpopular with those whose business it was to care for him. They showed him no mercy. Each day, including the hours of the night when the night watch took a hand, he was belabored with fists, broom handles, and frequently with the heavy bunch of keys which attendants usually carry on a long chain. He was also kicked and choked, and his suffering was aggravated by his almost continuous confinement in the bullpen. An exception to the general rule, for such continued abuse often causes death, this man lived a long time, five years, as I learned later. Another victim, 
forty-five years of age, was one who had formerly been a successful man of affairs. His was a forceful personality, and the traits of his sane days influenced his conduct when he broke down mentally. He was in the expansive phase of paresis, a phase distinguished by an exaggerated sense of well-being, and by delusions of grandeur which are symptoms of this form as well as of several other forms of mental disease. Paresis, as everyone knows, is considered incurable, and victims of it seldom live more than three or four years. In this instance, instead of trying to make the patient's last days comfortable, the attendant subjected him to a course of treatment severe enough to have sent even a sound man to an early grave. I endured privations and severe abuse for one month at the state hospital. This man suffered in all ways worse treatments for many months. I became well acquainted with two jovial and witty Irishmen. They were common laborers. One was a hod-carrier and a strapping fellow. When he arrived at the institution, he was at once placed in the violent ward, though his violence consisted of nothing more than an annoying sort of irresponsibility. He irritated the attendants by persistently doing certain trivial things after they had been forbidden. The attendants made no allowance for his condition of mind. His repetition of a forbidden act was interpreted as deliberate disobedience. He was physically powerful, and they determined to cow him. Of the master assault by which they attempted to do this, I was not an eyewitness, but I was an ear-witness. It was committed behind a closed door, and I heard the dull thuds of the blows, and I heard the cries for mercy, until there was no breath left in the man with which he could beg even for his life. For days that wrecked Hercules dragged himself about the ward moaning pitifully. He complained of pain in his side, and had difficulty breathing, which would seem to indicate that some of his ribs had been fractured. This man was often punished frequently for complaining of the torture already inflicted. But later, when he began to return to the normal, his good humor and native wit won for him an increasing degree of good treatment. The other patient's arch offense, a symptom of his disease, was that he gabbled incessantly. He could no more stop talking than he could write his reason on command. Yet his failure to become silent at a word was the signal for punishment. On one occasion, an attendant ordered him to stop talking and take a seat at the further end of the corridor, about forty feet distant. He was doing his best to obey, even running to keep ahead of the attendant at his heels. As they passed the spot where I was sitting, the attendant felled him with a blow behind the ear, and in falling, the patient's head barely missed the wall. Addressing me, the attendant said, "'Did you see that?' "'Yes.' I replied, and I'll not forget it. Be sure to report it to the doctor, he said, which remark showed his contempt, not only for me, but for those in authority. The man who had so terribly beaten me was particularly flagrant in annoying the claims of age. On more than one occasion he viciously attacked a man of over fifty, who, however, seemed much older. He was a Yankee sailing master, who in his prime could have thrashed his tormentor with ease. But now he was helpless and could only submit. However, he was not utterly abandoned by his old world. His wife called often to see him, and because of his condition she was permitted to visit him in his room. Once she arrived a few hours after he had been cruelly beaten. Naturally she asked the attendants how he had come by the hurts, the blackened eye and the bruised head. True to the code, they lied. The good wife, perhaps herself a Yankee, was not thus to be fooled, and her growing belief that her husband had been assaulted was confirmed by a sight she saw before her visit was ended. Another patient, a foreigner who was a target for abuse, was knocked flat two or three times as he was roughly forced along the corridor. I saw this little affair, and I saw that the good wife saw it. The next day she called again and took her husband home. The result was that after a few, probably sleepless, nights, she had to return him to the hospital and trust to God rather than the state to protect him. 
Another victim was a man sixty years of age. He was quite inoffensive, and no patient in the ward seemed to attend more strictly to his own business. Shortly after my transfer from the violent ward, this man was so viciously attacked that his arm was broken. The attendant, the man who had so viciously assaulted me, was summarily discharged. Unfortunately, however, the relief afforded the insane was slight and brief, for this same brute, like another whom I have mentioned, soon secured a position in another institution, this one, however, a thousand miles distant. Death by violence in a violent ward is, after all, not an unnatural death for a violent ward. This patient, of whom I am about to speak, was also an old man, over sixty. Both physically and mentally he was a wreck. On being brought to the institution, he was at once placed in a cell in the bullpen, probably because of his previous history for violence while at his own home. But his violence, if it ever existed, had already spent itself, and had come to be nothing more than an utter incapacity to obey. His offense was that he was too weak to attend to his common wants. The day after his arrival, shortly before noon, he lay stark naked and helpless upon the bed in his cell. This I know, for I went to investigate immediately after a wardmate had informed me of the vicious way in which the head attendant had assaulted the sick man. My informant was a man whose word regarding an incident of this character I would take as readily as that of any man I know. He came to me, knowing that I had taken upon myself the duty of reporting such abominations. My informant feared to take the initiative, for, like many other patients who believe themselves doomed to continued confinement, he feared to invite abuse at the hands of vengeful attendants. I therefore promised him that I would report the case as soon as I had an opportunity. All day long this victim of an attendant's unmanly passion lay in his cell in what seemed to be a semi-conscious condition. I took particular pains to observe his condition, for I felt that the assault of the morning might result in death. That night, after the doctor's regular tour of inspection, the patient in question was transferred to a room next to my own. The mode of transfer impressed itself upon my memory. Two attendants, one of them being he who had so brutally beaten the patient, placed the man in a sheet, and, each taking an end, carried the hammock-like contrivance, with its inert contents, to what proved to be its last resting place above ground. The bearers seemed as much concerned about their burden as one might be about a dead dog, waited and ready for the river. That night the patient died. Whether he was murdered none can ever know, but it is my honest opinion that he was. Though he might never have recovered, it is plain that he would have lived days, perhaps months, and had he been humanely, nay scientifically, treated, who can say that he might not have been restored to health and home? The young man who had been my companion in mischief in the violent ward was also terribly abused. I am sure I do not exaggerate when I say that on ten occasions, within a period of two months, this man was cruelly assaulted, and I do not know how many times he suffered assaults of less severity. After one of these chastisements, I asked him why he persisted in his petty transgressions when he knew that he thereby invited such body-racking abuse. Oh, he said laconically, I need the exercise. To my mind, the man who, with such gracious humor, could refer to what was in reality torture, deserved to live a century. But an unkind fate decreed that he should die young. Ten months after his commitment to the state hospital, he was discharged as improved, but not cured. This was not an unusual procedure, nor was it in his case apparently an unwise one, for he seemed fit for freedom. During the first month of regained liberty, he hanged himself. He left no message of excuse. In my opinion, none was necessary. For aught any man knows, the memories of the abuse torture and injustice which were so long his portion 
may have proved to be the last straw which overbalanced the desire to live. Patients with less stamina than mine often submitted with meekness, and none so aroused my sympathy as those whose submission was due to the consciousness that they had no relatives or friends to support them in a fight for their rights. On behalf of these, with my usual piece of smuggled lead pencil, I soon began to indict and submit to the officers of the institution letters in which I described the cruel practices which came under my notice. My reports were perfunctorily accepted and at once forgotten or ignored. Yet these letters, so far as they related to overt acts witnessed, were lucid and should have been convincing. Furthermore, my allegations were frequently corroborated by bruises on the bodies of the patients. My usual custom was to write an account of each assault and hand it to the doctor in authority. Frequently I would submit these reports to the attendants with instructions first to read and then deliver them to the superintendent or the assistant physician. The men whose cruelty I thus laid bare read with evident but perverted pleasure my accounts of assaults, and laughed and joked about my ineffectual attempts to bring them to book. End of chapter 22「Of a Mind That Found Itself » by Clifford Whittingham Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by Tom Daly. Chapter 23 I refused to be a martyr. Rebellion was my watchword. The only difference between the doctor's opinion of me and mine of him was that he could refuse utterance to his thoughts. Yes, there was another difference. Mine could be expressed only in words, his in grim acts. I repeatedly made demands for those privileges to which I knew I was entitled. When he saw fit to grant them, I gave him perfunctory thanks. When he refused, as he usually did, I at once poured upon his head the vials of my wrath. One day I would be on the friendliest terms with the doctor. The next I would upbraid him for some denial of my rights, or, as frequently happened, for not intervening in behalf of the rights of others. It was after one of these wrangles that I was placed in a cold cell in the bullpen at eleven o'clock one morning. Still without shoes, and with no more covering than underclothes, I was forced to stand, sit, or lie upon a bare floor as hard and cold as the pavement outside. Not until sundown was I provided even with a drugget, and this did little good, for already I had become thoroughly chilled. In consequence, I contracted a severe cold, which added greatly to my discomfort and might have led to serious results had I been of less sturdy fiber. This day was the 13th of December, and the 22nd of my exile in the violent ward. I remember it distinctly, for it was the 77th birthday of my father, to whom I wished to write a congratulatory letter. This had been my custom for years when absent from home on that anniversary, and well do I remember when, and under what conditions, I asked the doctor for permission. It was night. I was flat on my drugget bed. My cell was lighted only by the feeble rays of a lantern held by an attendant to the doctor on this his regular visit. At first I couched my request in polite language. The doctor merely refused to grant it. I then put forth my plea in a way calculated to arouse sympathy. He remained unmoved. I then pointed out that he was defying the law of the state which provided that a patient should have stationery, a statute, the spirit of which at least meant that he should be permitted to communicate with his conservator. It was now three weeks since I had been permitted to write or send a letter to anyone. Contrary to my custom, therefore, I made my final demand in the form of a concession. I promised that I would write only a conventional note of congratulation, making no mention whatever of my plight. 
It was a fair offer, but to accept it would have been an implied admission that there was something to conceal, and for this, if for no other reason, it was refused. Thus, day after day, I was repressed in a manner which probably would have driven many a sane man to violence. Yet the doctor would frequently exhort me to play the gentleman. Were good manners and sweet submission ever the product of such treatment? Deprived of my clothes, of sufficient food, of warmth, of all sane companionship, and of my liberty, I told those in authority that so long as they should continue to treat me as the vilest of criminals, I should do my best to complete the illusion. The burden of proving my sanity was placed upon me. I was told that so soon as I became polite and meek and lowly, I should find myself in possession of my clothes and of certain privileges. In every instance I must earn my reward before being entrusted with it. If the doctor, instead of demanding of me all the negative virtues in the catalogue of spineless saints, had given me my clothes on the condition that they would be taken from me again if I so much as removed a button, his course would doubtless have been productive of good results. Thus I might have had my clothes three weeks earlier than I did, and so been spared much suffering from the cold. I clamored daily for a lead pencil. This little luxury represents the margin of happiness for hundreds of the patients, just as a plug or package of tobacco represents the margin of happiness for thousands of others. But for seven weeks no doctor or attendant gave me one. To be sure, by reason of my somewhat exceptional persistence and ingenuity, I managed to be always in possession of some substitute for a pencil surreptitiously obtained a fact which no doubt had something to do with the doctor's indifference to my request. But my inability to secure a pencil in a legitimate way was a needless source of annoyance to me, and many of my verbal indiscretions were directly inspired by the doctor's continued refusal. It was an assistant physician, other than the one regularly in charge of my case, who at last relented and presented me with a good, whole, lead pencil. By so doing, he placed himself high on my list of benefactors. For that little shaft-like implement, magnified by my lively appreciation, became as the very axis of the earth. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 Of a Mind That Found Itself By Clifford Whittingham Beers this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by Tom Daly. Chapter 24 A few days before Christmas, my most galling deprivation was at last removed. That is, my clothes were restored. These I treated with great respect. Not so much as a threat did I destroy. Clothes, as is known, have a sobering and civilizing effect and from the moment I was again provided with presentable outer garments, my conduct rapidly improved. The assistant physician with whom I had been on such variable terms of friendship and enmity even took me for a sleigh ride. With this improvement came other privileges, or rather, the granting of my rights. Late in December I was permitted to send letters to my conservator. Though some of my blood-curdling letters were confiscated, a few detailing my experiences were forwarded. The account of my sufferings naturally distressed my conservator, but, as he said when he next visited me, what could I have done to help you? If the men in this state whose business it is to run these institutions cannot manage you, I am at a loss to know what to do. True, he could have done little or nothing, for he did not then know the ins and outs of the baffling situation into which the ties of blood had drawn him. About the middle of January, the doctor in charge of my case went for a two-weeks vacation. During his absence, an older member of the staff took charge of the violent ward, a man of wider experience and more liberal ideas than his predecessor, 
he at once granted me several real privileges. One day he permitted me to pay a brief visit to the best ward, the one from which I had been transferred two months earlier. I thus was able again to mingle with many seemingly normal men, and though I enjoyed this privilege upon but one occasion, and then only for a few hours, it gave me intense satisfaction. Altogether, the last six weeks of the fourteen during which I was confined in the violent ward were comfortable and relatively happy. I was no longer subjected to physical abuse, though this exemption was largely due to my own skill in avoiding trouble. I was no longer cold and hungry. I was allowed a fair amount of outdoor exercise, which, after my close confinement, proved to be a delightful shock. But above all, I was again given an adequate supply of stationery and drawing materials, which became as tinder under the focused rays of my artistic eagerness. My mechanical investigations were gradually set aside. Art and literature again held sway. Except when out of doors taking my allotted exercise, I remained in my room reading, writing, or drawing. This room of mine soon became a mecca for the most irresponsible and loquacious characters in the ward, but I soon schooled myself to shut my ears to the incoherent prattle of my unwelcome visitors. Occasionally, some of them would become obstreperous, perhaps because of my lordly order to leave the room. Often did they threaten to throttle me, but I ignored the threats, and they were never carried out. Nor was I afraid that they would be. Invariably, I induced them to obey. The drawings I produced at this time were crude. For the most part, they consisted of copies of illustrations which I had cut from magazines that had miraculously found their way into the violent ward. The heads of men and women interested me most, for I had decided to take up portraiture. At first, I was content to draw in black and white, but I soon procured some colors and from that time on devoted my attention to mastering pastel. In the world of letters I had made little progress. My compositions were, for the most part, epistles addressed to relatives and friends and to those in authority at the hospital. Frequently the letters addressed to the doctors were set in sets of three, this to save time, for I was very busy. The first letter of such a series would contain my request, couched in friendly and polite terms. To this I would add a postscript, worded about as follows. If, after reading this letter, you feel inclined to refuse my request, please read letter number two. Letter number two would be severely formal, a business-like repetition of the request made in letter number one. Again, a postscript would advise the reader to consult letter number three if the reading of number two had failed to move him. Letter number three was invariably a brief philippic in which I would consign the unaccommodating doctor to oblivion. In this way I expended part of my prodigious supply of feeling and energy. But I had also another way of reducing my creative pressure. Occasionally, from sheer excess of emotion, I would burst into verse of a quality not to be doubted. Of that quality the reader shall judge, for I am going to quote a creation written under circumstances which, to say the least, were adverse. Before writing these lines I had never attempted verse in my life, barring intentional inane doggerel. And as I now judge these lines, it is probably true that even yet I have never written a poem. Nevertheless, my involuntary, almost automatic outburst is at least suggestive of the fervor that was in me. These fourteen lines were written within thirty minutes of the time I first conceived the idea, and I present them substantially as they first took form. From a psychological standpoint, at least, I am told, they are not without interest. Light. Man's darkest hour is the hour before he's born. Another is the hour just before the dawn. From darkness unto life and light he leaps. To life but once, to light as oft as God wills he should. 
tis god's own secret why some live long and others early die for life depends on light and light on god who hath given to man the perfect knowledge that grim despair and sorrow end in light and life everlasting in realms where darkest darkness becomes light but not the light man knows which only is light because god told man so these verses which breathe religion were written in an environment which was anything but religious with curses of wardmates ringing in my ears some subconscious part of me seemed to force me to write at its dictation i was far from being in a pious frame of mind myself and the quality of my thoughts surprised me then as it does now End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of a mind that found itself by clifford whittingham beers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain read by tom daly chapter twenty five though i continued to respect my clothes i did not at once cease to tear such material as would serve me in my scientific investigations gravity being conquered it was inevitable that I should devote some of my time to the invention of a flying machine. This was soon perfected, in my mind, and all that I needed, that I might test the device, was my liberty. As usual, I was unable to explain how I should produce the result which I so confidently foretold, but I believed and proclaimed that I should, ere long, fly to st louis and claim and receive the one hundred thousand dollar reward offered by the commission of the louisiana purchase exposition for the most efficient airship to be exhibited the moment the thought winged its way through my mind i had not only a flying machine but a fortune in the bank being where i could not dissipate my riches i became a lavish verbal spender i was in a mood to buy anything and I whiled away many an hour planning what I should do with my fortune. The St. Louis prize was a paltry trifle. I reasoned that the man who could harness gravity had at his beck and call the world and all that therein is. This sudden accession of wealth made my vast humanitarian projects seem only the more feasible. What could be more delightful, I thought, than the furnishing and financing of ideas of a magnitude to stagger humanity my condition was one of ecstatic suspense give me my liberty and i would show a sleepy old world what could be done to improve conditions not only among the insane but along every line of beneficent endeavour the city of my birth was to be made a garden spot all defiling smoke-begrimed factories were to be banished to an innocuous distance churches were to give way to cathedrals the city itself was to become a paradise of mansions yale university was to be transformed into the most magnificent yet efficient seat of learning in the world for once college professors were to be paid adequate salaries and alluring provision for their declining years was to be made. New Haven should become a very hotbed of culture. Art galleries, libraries, museums, and theaters of a dreamlike splendor were to rise whenever and wherever I should will. Why absurd? Was it not I who would defray the cost? The famous buildings of the old world were to be reproduced if, indeed, the originals could not be purchased brought to this country and reassembled not far from new haven there is a sandy plain once the bed of the connecticut river but now a kind of miniature desert i often smile as i pass it on the train for it was here for the edification of those who might never be able to visit the valley of the nile that i planned to erect a pyramid that should out cheops the original my harnessed gravity i believed would not only enable me to overcome existing mechanical difficulties but it would make the quarrying of immense monoliths as easy as the slicing of bread 
and the placing of them in position as easy as the laying of bricks. After all, delusions of grandeur are the most entertaining of toys. The assortment which my imagination provided was a comprehensive one. I had tossed aside the blocks of childhood days. Instead of laboriously piling small squares of wood one upon another in an endeavor to build the tiny semblance of a house, I now, in this second childhood of mine, projected against thin air phantom edifices planned and completed in the twinkling of an eye. To be sure, such houses of cards almost immediately superseded one another, but the vanishing of one could not disturb a mind that had ever another interesting bauble to take its place. And therein lies part of the secret of the happiness peculiar to that stage of elation, which is distinguished by delusions of grandeur, always provided that he who is possessed by them be not subjected to privation and abuse. The sane man who can prove that he is rich in material wealth is not nearly so happy as the mentally disordered man whose delusions trick him into believing himself a modern Croesus. A wealth of Midas-like delusions is no burden. Such a fortune, though a misfortune in itself, bathes the world in a golden glow. No clouds obscure the vision. Optimism reigns supreme. Failure and impossible are as words from an unknown tongue. And the unique satisfaction about a fortune of this fugitive type is that its loss occasions no regret. One by one the phantom ships of treasure sail away for parts unknown, until, when the last ship has become but a speck on the mental horizon, the observer makes the happy discovery that his pirate fleet has left behind it a priceless wake of reason. End of chapter 25《Chapter Twenty Six of A Mind That Found Itself by Clifford Whittingham Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by Tom Daly. Chapter Twenty Six Early in March, nineteen o two, having lived in a violent ward for nearly four months, I was transferred to another, a ward quite as orderly as the best in the institution though less attractively furnished than the one in which I had first been placed. Here also I had a room to myself. In this instance, however, the room had not only a bed, but a chair and a wardrobe. With this elaborate equipment I was soon able to convert my room into a veritable studio, whereas in the violent ward it had been necessary for me to hide my writings and drawing materials to keep other patients from taking them, in my new abode I was able to conduct my literary and artistic pursuits without the annoyances which had been inevitable during the preceding months. Soon after my transfer to this ward, I was permitted to go out of doors and walk to the business section of the city, two miles distant. But on these walks I was always accompanied. To one who has never surrendered any part of his liberty, such surveillance would no doubt seem irksome. Yet to me, after being so closely confined, the ever-present attendant seemed a companion rather than a guard. These excursions into the sane and free world were not only a great pleasure, they were almost a tonic. To rub elbows with normal people tended to restore my mental poise. That the casual passer-by had no way of knowing that I was a patient out for a walk about the city helped me gain that self-confidence so essential to the success of one about to re-enter a world from which he had long been cut off. My first trips to the city were made primarily for the purpose of supplying myself with writing and drawing materials. While enjoying these welcome tastes of liberty, on more than one occasion I surreptitiously mailed certain letters which I did not dare entrust to the doctor. Under ordinary circumstances, such an act on the part of one enjoying a special privilege would be dishonorable. But the circumstances that then obtained were not ordinary. I was simply protecting myself against what I believed to be unjust and illegal confiscation of letters. 
I have already described how an assistant physician arbitrarily denied my request that I be permitted to send a birthday letter to my father, thereby not merely exceeding his authority and ignoring decency, but, consciously or unconsciously, stifling a sane impulse. That this should occur while I was confined in the bullpen was, perhaps, not so surprising. But about four months later, while I was in one of the best wards, a similar, though less open, interference occurred. At this time I was so nearly normal that my discharge was a question of but a very few months. Anticipating my return to my old world, I decided to renew former relationships. Accordingly, my brother, at my suggestion, informed certain friends that I should be pleased to receive letters from them. They soon wrote. In the meantime, the doctor had been instructed to deliver to me any and all letters that might arrive. He did so for a time, and that without censoring. As was to be expected, after three almost letterless years, I found rare delight in replying to my reawakened correspondence. Yet some of these letters, written for the deliberate purpose of re-establishing myself in the sane world, were destroyed by the doctor in authority. At the time, not one word did he say to me about the matter. I had handed him for mailing certain letters unsealed. He did not mail them, nor did he forward them to my conservator as he should have done, and had earlier agreed to do, with all letters which he could not see his way clear to approve. It was fully a month before I learned that my friends had not received my replies to their letters. Then I accused the doctor of destroying them, and he, with belated frankness, admitted that he had done so. He offered no better excuse than the mere statement that he did not approve of the sentiments I had expressed. Another flagrant instance was that of a letter addressed to me in reply to one of those which I had posted surreptitiously. The person to whom I wrote, a friend of years standing, later informed me that he had sent the reply. I never received it. Neither did my conservator. Were it not that I feel absolutely sure that the letter in question was received at the hospital and destroyed, I should not now raise this point. But such a point, if raised at all, must of course be made without that direct proof which can come only from the man guilty of an act which in the sane world is regarded as odious and criminal. I therefore need not dilate on the reasons which made it necessary for me to smuggle, as it were, to the governor of the state, a letter of complaint and instruction. This letter was written shortly after my transfer from the violent ward. The abuses of that ward were still fresh in my mind, and the memory of distressing scenes was kept vivid by reports reaching me from friends who were still confined there. These private sleuths of mine I talked with at the evening entertainments or at other gatherings. From them I learned that brutality had become more rife, if anything, since I had left the ward. Realizing that my crusade against the physical abuse of patients thus far had proved of no avail, I determined to go over the heads of the doctors and appeal to the ex officio head of the institution, the governor of the state. On March 12, 1903, I wrote a letter which so disturbed the governor that he immediately set about an informal investigation of some of my charges. Despite its prolixity, its unconventional form, and what under other circumstances would be characterized as almost diabolic impudence and familiarity, as he said months later when I talked with him, rang true. The writing of it was an easy matter. In fact, so easy because of the pressure of truth under which I was laboring at the time, that it embodied a compelling spontaneity. The mailing of it was not so easy. I knew that the only sure way of getting my thoughts before the governor was to do my own mailing. Naturally, no doctor could be trusted to send an indictment against himself and his colleagues to the one man in the state who had the power to institute such an investigation as might make it necessary for all to seek employment elsewhere. In my frame of mind, to wish to mail my letter was to know how to accomplish the wish. The letter was in reality a booklet. 
I had thoughtfully used waterproof India drawing ink in writing it, in order, perhaps, that a remote posterity might not be deprived of the document. The booklet consisted of thirty-two eight-by-ten pages of heavy white drawing paper. These I sewed together. In planning the form of my letter, I had forgotten to consider the slot of a letter-box of average size. Therefore, I had to adopt an unusual method of getting the letter into the mails. My expedient was simple. There was in town a certain shop where I traded. At my request, the doctor gave me permission to go there for supplies. I was, of course, accompanied by an attendant who little suspected what was under my vest. To conceal and carry my letter in that place had been easy, but to get rid of it after reaching my goal was another matter. Watching my opportunity, I slipped the missive between the leaves of a copy of the Saturday Evening Post. This I did, believing that some purchaser would soon discover the letter and mail it. Then I left the shop. On the back of the wrapper I had endorsed the following words, Mr. Postmaster, this package is unsealed. Nevertheless, it is first-class matter. Everything I write is necessarily first-class. I have affixed two two-cent stamps. If extra postage is needed, you will do the governor a favor if you will put the extra postage on, or affix due stamps and let the governor pay his own bills, as he can well afford to. If you want to know who I am, just ask His Excellency and oblige. Yours truly, question mark. Flanking this notice, I had arrayed other forceful sentiments as follows, taken from statutes which I had framed for the occasion. Any person finding letter or package, duly stamped and addressed, must mail same, as said letter or package is really in hands of the government the moment the stamp is affixed. And again, failure to comply with federal statute, which forbids any one except addressee to open a letter, renders one liable to imprisonment in state prison. My letter reached the governor. One of the clerks at the shop in which I left the missive found and mailed it. From him I afterwards learned that my unique instructions had piqued his curiosity as well as compelled my wished-for action. Assuming that the reader's curiosity may likewise have been piqued, I shall quote certain passages from this four-thousand-word epistle of protest. The opening sentence read as follows. If you have had the courage to read the above, referring to an unconventional heading, I hope you will read on to the end of this epistle, thereby displaying real Christian fortitude and learning a few facts which I think should be brought to your attention. I then introduced myself, mentioning a few common friends by way of indicating that I was not without influential political connections, and proceeded as follows. I take pleasure in informing you that I am in the crazy business and am holding my job down with ease and a fair degree of grace. Being in the crazy business, I understand certain phases of the business about which you know nothing. You as governor are at present head devil in this hell, though I know you are unconsciously acting as His Majesty's First Lieutenant. I then launched into my arraignment of the treatment of the insane. The method, I declared, was wrong from start to finish. The abuses existing here exist in every other institution of the kind in the country. They are all alike, though some of them are, of course, worse than others. Hell is hell the world over, and I might also add that hell is only a great big bunch of disagreeable details anyway. That's all an insane asylum is. If you don't believe it, just go crazy and take up your abode here. In writing this letter, I am laboring under no mental excitement. I am no longer subjected to the abuses about which I complain. I am well and happy. In fact, I never was so happy as I am now. Whether I am in perfect mental health or not, I shall leave for you to decide. If I am insane today, I hope I may never recover my reason. First I assailed the management of the private institution 
where I had been straitjacketed and referred to Jekyll Hyde as Dr. Blank, M.D., mentally deranged. Then followed an account of the straitjacket experience, then an account of abuses at the state hospital. I described in detail the most brutal assaults that fell to my lot. In summing up, I said, the attendants claimed next day that I had called them certain names. Maybe I did, though I don't believe I did at all. What of it? This is no young lady's boarding school. Should a man be nearly killed because he swears at attendants who swear like pirates? I have seen at least fifteen men, many of them mental and physical wrecks, assaulted just as brutally as I was, and usually without a cause. I know that men's lives have been shortened by these brutal assaults, and that is only a polite way of saying that murder has been committed here. Turning next to the matter of the women's wards, I said, A patient in this ward, a man in his right mind, who leaves here on Tuesday next, told me that a woman patient told him that she had seen many a helpless woman dragged along the floor by her hair, and had also seen them choked by attendants who used a wet towel as a sort of garrote. I have been through the mill and believe every word of the abuse. You will perhaps doubt it, as it seems impossible. Bear in mind, though, that everything bad and disagreeable is possible in an insane asylum. It will be observed that I was shrewd enough to qualify a charge I could not prove. When I came to the matter of the bullpen, I wasted no words. The bullpen, I wrote, is a pocket edition of the New York Stock Exchange during a panic. I next pointed out the difficulties a patient must overcome in mailing letters. It is impossible for anyone to send a letter to you via the office. The letter would be consigned to the wastebasket, unless it was a particularly crazy letter, in which case it might reach you, as you would then pay no attention to it. But a sane letter and a true letter, telling about the abuses which exist here, would stand no show of being mailed. The way in which mail is tampered with by the medical staff is contemptible. I then described my stratagem in mailing my letter to the governor. Discovering that I had left a page of my epistolary booklet blank, I drew upon it a copy of Rembrandt's Anatomy Lesson, and under it wrote, This page was skipped by mistake, had to fight fifty-three days to get writing paper, and I hate to waste any space, hence the masterpiece, drawn in five minutes. Never drew a line till September 26th last, and never took lessons in my life. I think you will readily believe my statement. Continuing in the same half-bantering vein, I said, I intend to immortalize all members of medical staff of State Hospital for the Insane when I illustrate my inferno, which, when written, will make Dante's Divine Comedy look like a French farce. I then outlined my plans for reform. Whether my suggestions meet with approval or not, I wrote, will not affect the result. Though opposition on your part would perhaps delay reforms. I have decided to devote the next few years of my life to correcting abuses now in existence in every asylum in this country. I know how these abuses can be corrected, and I intend, later on when I understand the subject better, to draw up a Bill of Rights for the insane. Every state in the Union will pass it, because it will be founded on the Golden Rule. I am desirous of having the cooperation of the Governor of Connecticut, but if my plans do not appeal to him, I shall deal directly with his only superior, the President of the United States. When Theodore Roosevelt hears my story, his blood will boil. I would write him now, but I am afraid he would jump in and correct abuses too quickly, and by doing it too quickly, too little good would be accomplished. Waxing crafty, Yet, as I believed, writing truth, I continued, I need money badly, and if I cared to, I could sell my information and services to the New York World or New York Journal for a large amount. 
but I do not intend to advertise Connecticut as a hellhole of iniquity, insanity, and injustice. If the facts appeared in the public press at this time, Connecticut would lose caste with her sister states, and they would profit by Connecticut's disgrace and correct the abuses before they could be put on the rack. As these conditions prevail throughout the country, there is no reason why Connecticut should get all the abuse and criticism which would follow any such revelation of disgusting abuse. Such inhuman treatment of human wrecks. If publicity is necessary to force you to act, and I am sure it will not be necessary, I shall apply for a writ of habeas corpus, and, in proving my sanity to a jury, I shall incidentally prove your own incompetence, permitting such a whirlwind reformer to drag Connecticut's disgrace into open court would prove your incompetence. For several obvious reasons, it is well that I did not at that time attempt to convince a jury that I was mentally sound. The mere outlining of my ambitious scheme for reform would have caused my immediate return to the hospital. That scheme, however, was a sound and feasible one, as later events have proved. But taking hold of me, as it did, while my imagination was at white heat, I was impelled to attack my problem with compromising energy, and, for a time, in a manner so unconvincing as to obscure the essential sanity of my cherished purpose. I closed my letter as follows. No doubt you will consider certain parts of this letter rather fresh, I apologize for any such passages now, but, as I have an insane license, I do not hesitate to say what I think. What's the use when one is caged like a criminal? P.S. This letter is a confidential one, and is to be returned to the writer upon demand. The letter was eventually forwarded to my conservator, and is now in my possession. As a result of my protest, the governor immediately interrogated the superintendent of the institution where Jekyll Hyde had tortured me. Until he laid before the superintendent my charges against his assistant, the doctor in authority had not even suspected that I had been tortured. This superintendent took pride in his institution. He was sensitive to criticism, and it was natural that he should strive to palliate the offense of his subordinate. He said that I was a most troublesome patient, which was indeed the truth, for I had always a way of my own for doing the things that worried those in charge of me. In a word, I brought to bear upon the situation what I have previously referred to as an uncanny admixture of sanity. The governor did not meet the assistant physician who had maltreated me. The reprimand, if there was to be any, was left to the superintendent to administer. In my letter to the governor, I had laid more stress upon the abuses to which I had been subjected at this private institution than I had upon conditions at the state hospital where I was when I wrote to him. This may have had some effect on the action he took, or rather failed to take. At any rate, as to the state hospital, no action was taken. Not even a word of warning was sent to the officials, as I later learned, for before leaving the institution I asked them. Though my letter did not bring about an investigation, it was not altogether without results. Naturally, it was with considerable satisfaction that I informed the doctors that I had outwitted them, and it was with even greater satisfaction that I now saw those in authority make a determined, if temporary, effort to protect helpless patients against the cruelties of attendance. The moment the doctors were convinced that I had gone over their heads and had sent a characteristic letter of protest to the governor of the state, that moment they began to protect themselves with an energy born of a realization of their former shortcomings. Whether or not the management in question ever admitted that their unwanted activity was due to my successful stratagem, the fact remains that the summary discharge of several attendants accused and proved guilty of brutality immediately followed, 
and for a while put a stop to wanton assaults against which for a period of four months i had protested in vain patients who still lived in the violent ward told me that comparative peace reigned about this time End of chapter 26